as of right now. Wilder Fury 2, here we go. Of 2014, several years ago, amidst talks of a potential undisputed heavyweight title fight between the then reigning unified champion Vladimir Klitschko and Bermain Stavern, and a potential fight between Wilder and the reigning WBC champion Bermain Stavern, Wilder said that he wanted $10 million in step aside money to let Stavern fight someone else. Presumably, Vladimir Klitschko in an undisputed heavyweight title fight, what would have been a more lucrative fight for Stavern, a more beneficial fight to the division. More historic. And Wilder, he still would have got to face the winner because he still would have been the mandatory challenger. Oh. That's not what Wilder wanted. Deontay Wilder's team never fancied that fight with Vladimir. Vladimir, who would have been the betting favorite against Bermain Stavern. Oh. Vladimir, the then reigning WBA, WBO, IBF, and Ring Magazine champion. Wilder's team never wanted that fight. They didn't want it before Wilder became a champion. They didn't want it after Wilder became a champion. It's painfully obvious in Wilder becoming the mandatory challenger for the one belt that Vladimir didn't have. Oh. When watching boxing at that time knew who the authority was in the heavyweight division. And it wasn't Bermain Stavern. Bermain, who won the vacant WBC title after Vitaly Klitschko retired. Bermain, who won the vacant WBC title that was up for grabs in his rematch with Chris Ariola. Vitaly retired a champion. Once he retired and his WBC title became vacant, Bermain Stavern picked it up. That's how he got it. Deontay Wilder, who had already been a professional boxer for roughly six years in 2014, having debuted in November of 2008. Deontay Wilder, the professional boxer of six years, never got around to fighting Vitaly for the WBC title. Nope. And he never got around to fighting Vlad for any of his either. Nope. He did have a lot of interest in facing Bermain Stavern for some reason. Wilder was around for both Klitschko brothers and never fought one. Vitaly Klitschko retired from the sport of boxing in late 2013, towards the end of the year in December. His title goes vacant by the time the following year rolls around and Deontay Wilder decides to finally fight for it. Decides to become that title's mandatory challenger. He does. He beats Bermain Stavern in early 2015. At this time, he's already blocked undisputed once. At least once. At this time, he would have already stood in the way of what could have been the undisputed heavyweight title fight between Bermain Stavern, the then WBC champion, and Vladimir Klitschko because of his asking price, $10 million. At this time, Deontay Wilder wasn't making nowhere near that kind of money. Nowhere near. This is when he was still with Golden Boy Promotions. Who made the fight between him and Bermain Stavern. He would have already gotten in the way of the undisputed heavyweight title fight at least once before becoming a world champion himself. He would have got in the way of the undisputed heavyweight title fight once more after he beat Bermain Stavern. After he won the WBC title in early... 2015. That's because after he won the title, his manager, Shelly Finkel, stated in so many words that he would not be rushed into a Klitschko fight. It was in January of 2015. This time, Deontay Wilder had been a professional boxer for seven years, count them, seven fucking years, and 32 professional fights. But apparently to Shelly Finkel, he was a baby. That's what he said. It's funny. You often hear the Klitschko era, the Vitaly Klitschko era, the Vladimir Klitschko era, referred to as a weak era, a weak time for the heavyweight division, and a time when most Americans just weren't interested in what was going on with the heavyweights. It's interesting because Deontay Wilder was there for a sizable portion of that era. He'd been around since 2008, when he debuted as a professional. He was around for most of that era. Tally didn't retire till late 2013. And Vladimir, Vladimir had not lost his world titles to Tyson Fury till late. 
2015. Deontay Wilder was around for all of this, all of it. Deontay Wilder is very much a part of that quote-unquote weak era of boxing, with the difference being that while the division and its top contenders were fighting each other, Deontay Wilder was feasting on unheralded fat cruiserweights with losing records. Guided away from all the real action in the division. When people say that the Klitschko era was a weak era, just remember, Deontay Wilder was a part of that era. He still didn't want to mix it up with anybody. Hadn't fought a top contender or a solid opponent of any kind, having debuted 2008, November of 2008. He hadn't fought anybody solid until, I don't know, January of 2015, when he fought Bermain Stavern. That's roughly six, seven years, roughly. Let's get back to the point. January of 2015, Deontay Wilder would have gotten in the way of the undisputed heavyweight title fight at least once before he actually won the belt when he demanded that he be paid $10 million to step aside. Nobody was going to give him that kind of money. And Deontay Wilder himself, he wasn't making that kind of money. He set that astronomical asking price knowing nobody was going to give him that kind of scratch. Nobody was going to give him that kind of cash. And thus was able to get in the way of the undisputed heavyweight title fight. That's before he won the title. After he won the title, his manager says, look, Wilder's a baby winning the title. It was his first title fight. There'll be time for unification. There'll be time for all those things. He could go fight Povetkin, the number two contender in Russia, and make $10 million. Finkel said to the Tuscaloosa News, it's not the right thing yet. Give him a couple of fights. Maybe bring something back to Alabama. Let him develop. Bear in mind, the man's been a professional boxer for six, seven years, but he's still developing, apparently. Or he was. Let him develop, just like any other athlete. Don't take someone who is a great college prospect. Are you hearing this? Fuck. A newly crowned champion is being referred to as a prospect, having been a professional boxer for seven years and 32 fights. Don't take someone who's a great college prospect and throw him right in, and this kid is a great prospect. So we've established that Deontay Wilder didn't want any parts of Vladimir before he became a champion or after. They had plans to fight all kinds of other people, Povetkin maybe in Russia for a couple mil, something in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. It never seemed like it was the right time for the Wilder people to unify with Vladimir. You fast forward, Vladimir loses his titles to Tyson Fury, Tyson Fury goes on his cocaine binge and, and relinquishes the belt. Anthony Joshua comes along and picks them up, along with Joseph Parkier, who Anthony Joshua eventually unified with. And the conversation then becomes Joshua versus Wilder. We know that the Joshua people made several career high offers to Wilder. The initial offer was something to the tune of $12 million, a career high purse for Wilder, several times his highest purse at that time. These were all offers he rejected. Every single offer made to Wilder in order to unify with Anthony Joshua was bigger than the last and every single offer made to Wilder was for more money than he was earning at that time, yet he consistently rejected those offers, blocking the undisputed title fight for a third time. You wasted everybody's time with that $50 million bluff. One would assume that if you intend to pay someone $50 million, guaranteed $50 million up front, at some point you're going to have to meet up with them to discuss the particulars, yet Shelley Finkel, Deontay Wilder's manager, had no intention of meeting up with Eddie Hearn to discuss those particulars in reference to that offer. An offer which was little more than a publicity stunt, little more than just a bluff. That's it. Wilder was offered two times the amount of that bluff to sign on and fight Anthony Joshua by the time the people at the zone rolled around. Though by the time that the people at the zone rolled around, the offers were getting increasingly bigger for Deontay Wilder to face Anthony Joshua. Hell, before DeZone even came into the picture, they offered Deontay Wilder $15 million guaranteed up front, 35% of the upside. He didn't bite. They offer him another $15 million guaranteed up front at 40% of the pay-per-view upside, and he still didn't bite. Afterwards, the people at DeZone step in, attempt to mediate, offer this guy $100 million. That's two times the amount of his reported offer, which I reiterate was little more than just a bluff. And he still didn't bite. This would have been the third time that Deontay Wilder blocked the undisputed heavyweight title fight. That's what he does. You fast forward, some time passes, and Deontay Wilder gives Tyson Fury a shot. Tyson Fury an opportunity. Two fights, We're all fully aware of them. And in the second fight, which took place in February of last year, he gets beat. Tyson Fury gives Wilder the beating of his life. A thorough shellacking from pillar to post. The 
pandemic hit, live gates evaporate for a time. They didn't want to stage this thing behind closed doors. They had no intention of staging this fight in a studio setting because they'd made something like $16 million off the live gate. They weren't going to stage the rubber match without it. Third fight. The third fight that would have taken place last year had the pandemic not hit. The third fight where Tyson Fury was supposed to take home the lion's share of the pot, 60% to Deontay Wilder's 40%, having lost the second fight and having invoked the rematch clause. In some ways, that was the penalty, that if you lose and you activate that rematch clause, you ain't getting 50%, you're getting 40%. And there's a contractual dispute. Bob the Slob Arum claims that the contract expired, claims that... Tyson Fury is under no legal obligation to face Wilder for a third time, attempts to move on, attempts to negotiate a fight with Anthony Joshua for the undisputed heavyweight championship instead. And we all know how that worked out. Here we are. This would be the fourth time that Wilder, through some modus operandi, blocked the undisputed title fight. He's a cancer to boxing. He has blocked this division's undisputed title fight at least four times. If you want to be technical, he blocked the fight from happening every time. The people over there at Matchroom made him an offer from the 12.5 to the 15 mil guaranteed at 35% of the upside to the 15 mil guaranteed at 40% of the upside to the $100 million offer made to him by DAZN. You can count every one of those offers as a time that Wilder blocked the undisputed title fight, not even counting what took place before and after he became a champion and not even counting this. Wilder has been a thorn in the heavyweight division's side for a very long time. Wilder himself doesn't care about becoming an undisputed champion. I don't care what it is. At this point in time, it ain't even about the belts no more, baby. It ain't a, as I said, I'm the, I'm the most talked about, I'm the hottest fighter in the world right now, and I got one belt. And I only, I got one belt that's only, that means more than any other belts. What if it meant so much, why is Wilder's biggest fight to date a box office flop. Why was it a fight that ended up losing money, not making money? Why? Told you before, and I'll tell you here again. Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury turned to each other in order to create a super fight of their own because they know that neither one of them individually had enough leverage to get where they wanted to get with Anthony Joshua. Oh. So they joined forces, turned to each other, and had their own saga. Saga that is still unfolding here today. But even with that, Wilder versus Fury 2, whilst bringing in more pay-per-view buys than their first fight did, more than twice as many, that fight was a box office flop. They spent so much money putting that thing together just so that it wouldn't break even. They did good business at the gate. And they sold more than twice as many pay-per-views the second time out, but that still wasn't enough to cover the costs. That still wasn't enough to break even, let alone start making money. Now what they want to do is hold up undisputed yet again between Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua. They want to hold up undisputed to have a third fight with Tyson Fury. The sky's a cancer to boxing. So now that Wild is blocked undisputed again, the Fury people, they only really have two options. One is to get Wilder to agree to a step-aside deal so Joshua versus Fury can go ahead. That's option one. That's option number one. Option number two, Fury will have to fight Deontay Wilder. Frank Warren stated, they are in talks and working hard to make the first option happen, the Joshua versus Fury fight. I wouldn't get my hopes up, as Bob Arum has already stated, they've reserved Allegiant Stadium for a date late in July, July the 24th, for what could be the third fight between Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder. He said, we're not paying Wilder to step aside. It's better to get rid of him. We can take on Anthony Joshua in November or December. All of this could very well be a play by the Wilder people to get at some of that Saudi money because they know what that fight is worth to the Fury people. But Bob, being the greedy old prick that he is, he doesn't want to pay Wilder to step aside. For Bob, it's cheaper to just beat the guy again. He's a fucking cancer to boxing. Well, he's not the only one to blame. There is blame to be assigned to both Bob Arum and Tyson Fury. Tyson Fury, who called out Anthony Joshua immediately after the Pulev fight for a fight between them, knowing that the situation with Wilder wasn't over. Bob Arum and Frank Warren, who spent this whole time moaning at Eddie Hearn to get the deal done with the Saudis, knowing that the situation with Wilder isn't over. There's plenty of blame to assign to the Fury side of things. There really is. And if this fight is falling apart now, it's not Eddie Hearn's fault. Or Anthony Joshua's. This whole jackpot, this whole clusterfuck you got going on, 
on. This is your own fault. It's of your own design. If you weren't free to move on, then you shouldn't have tried to. Feeding the media a bunch of bullshit about how you ain't got to fight Wilder for a third time. Tyson Fury, Bob Arum, and Frank Warren have wasted a lot of people's time. Mine, yours, and especially Eddie Hearn's, Matchroom's, Anthony Joshua's. Would they have even moved to try and make the fight between Joshua and Fury if they knew that this was what was going to happen or that this could happen? Would they? Would they have tried to make that fight over there in Saudi Arabia? Or would they have proceeded with the original plan to have Anthony Joshua defend his title against his mandatory challenger, Oleksandr Yusik? Would they? How much time was put into that, how much time was wasted that nobody's gonna get back. So rest assured, Wilder is not the only guy to blame here, though he is the thorn in the heavyweight division side because he's blocked this division from seeing an undisputed champion for well over five years. And for what? What? Box office flops? I don't want to see a third fight. I imparted that much last year. I'm not interested in seeing Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder do the dance for a third time, regardless of what they agreed to. Nope. I don't give a fuck. I don't care. Nope. If I'm being honest, I don't know how much the world cares. You don't see Saudis bidding. On Wilder versus Fury. They've had two fights already. And not a single one of those two fights got the same level of global interest that Joshua versus Fury was getting. You don't see foreign countries around the world putting up millions upon millions upon millions of dollars to host that fight. You don't. And you don't see it happening now. You don't see it with a third. Joshua versus Fury would have broke records. And Joshua versus Fury would have been of some historical significance to the sport of boxing, to the people over there in the United Kingdom. It was an important fight that needed to happen. And once again, Deontay Wilder, some way, shape, or form, some modus operandi, has found a way to block an undisputed title fight from happening yet again, even when he's not a world champion himself. He's a cancer to the sport of boxing. That's what he's been, and that's what he is. It's possible that everything we're seeing is a play to get at some of that Saudi money. It's possible, but Bob Arum has no intention of paying Wilder to step aside. That's what he's saying in so many words. I mean, they didn't reserve Allegiant Stadium for July because they plan on paying Wilder to go away. Who says he wants to go away? Fiscally, it would make more sense for Wilder to step into some kind of a step aside agreement with the promise that he gets the winner of Joshua versus Fury, still get his title shot, still get his opportunity, and make himself some money. But Deontay Wilder has long been a thorn in the heavyweight division's side. That ain't about to change.